12:30 p.m. only on Bloomberg Quint. Welcome to Bloomberg Quint. You're watching The Fine Print and we're coming to you today from the campus of Jindal University in New Delhi. The Howard Law School and Law School Admission Council are in town to talk about the future of legal education in India. But before I introduce you to my distinguished guests, let me bring into the conversation the biggest stakeholder when we talk about legal education in India, the law students. And we have some of them turning out in good numbers. Uh, to tell us how they feel uh, about legal education in India and whether or not it prepares them for a career in law. Guys, I'm going to do a quick show of hands uh, on how you feel about uh, legal education in India. How many of you think that the cost of legal education in India is uh, excessive compared to what the market ends up paying for that skill? Quick show of hands. Do you think that the subjects that you end up studying in college are contemporary enough? Yes, okay, three. Okay, three of of out of 20 feel that they are contemporary enough. So the rest of you think that the curriculum needs to keep up with what's happening in the outside world? Do you think that there is a gap between what you're taught in law, law school and what the employers expect of you uh, when you go out there in the real world? There's a gap, there's no gap. And that sets the tone uh, of our conversation today on the three C's uh, when we're talking about future of legal education in India, uh, career, curriculum, and uh, cost. Uh, and to talk about the three C's, I have with me David Wilkins from Howard Law School, Kelly Testy from Law School Admission Council, Sandeep Berry from Shardul Amarchand Mangaldas to give us the employer perspective, uh, Shamnath Bashir of IDAI, who's doing some fabulous work in making uh, law school and legal education affordable for the marginalized in the society. And finally, Raj Kumar at the center of it all uh, from Jindal University, Welcome to the show, Kelly and gentlemen. David, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you've been studying the landscape of legal education, not just in India, but in Brazil, in China, in Chile. When we talk about the cost, uh, how do we compare with some of the other, other jurisdictions? And do you think, uh, as an outcome, uh, we are a costlier education market compared to some of the jurisdictions that you've been looking at? So cost is always a problem uh, in any education, particularly legal education. Uh, I'd say probably on the spectrum, to be very honest, India is lower cost than other jurisdictions, in part because India is uh, a mostly undergraduate law degree. It's oftentimes uh, a public law schools. In my country, for example, just to give you some comparison, the average cost of uh, one year of law school is well over 50,000 US dollars, and my law school is probably over 60,000 US dollars. So uh, if you put it in that comparison, uh, India is probably less expensive, certainly, than some jurisdictions. But I think the real issue is about value, is about what is the value the students are receiving, and whether they think that the education they're getting is preparing them for the jobs of the 21st century. And I think that is an important question and one we'll, I hope we'll have a chance to talk sure. about. Sure. Shabnath, let me bring you in. You're, you've been a student of a national law school here in India. You've been doing some fabulous work to get uh, to make legal education um, affordable, not just at the entrance level, but through the course of that education of that uh, or that college. Uh, is cost a deterrent for uh, some of the students that you have been speaking with over the last several years? Uh, and if you overcome that cost, is law a lucrative career for them? Uh, the most <coughs> reputed national law schools uh, within this country, uh, all of them charge fees um, at a fairly high level. Uh, and I think the right question to ask is, as David said, is are they delivering the right value? Uh, and I think we can we can have a, a separate debate just on that. I mean, because a lot of 
uh, the uh, law schools within the National Law School frame and a lot of the younger ones are charging the same ones as the older, more reputed ones, but without the infrastructure, without the faculty, without delivering the kind of quality legal education that they're delivering, um, and without any, you know, to, to me, the ideal law school is one that will charge per value, but will also have enough um, opportunities for low-income students to come in through scholarships and the other, so that you retain a diverse population of students. You see, if the students are all from one income bracket, they're all going to be thinking the same way. You're going to get a homogeneous set of students uh, and a kind of a group think. Uh, so for legal education itself and for uh, bringing more richness to legal education, I think it's important to get a variety of perspectives, particularly in a country like India, where, which is so diverse by itself. And you need to see that diversity reflected in the classroom, uh, particularly in law, because law is about society, law is about social change, law is about all these things. And if you're just going to get one set of people coming into the top law schools and going into the top brackets of the legal profession, you've got a serious problem. Sure. Okay. Let me, you know, bring the conversation to you guys, and you know, please feel free to uh, chip in uh, with a question or two. Uh, for how many of you, when you were considering, let's say, a law career versus, let's say, engineering or medical? Uh, cost was one of the factors compared to what you end up getting when you're out there in the market looking for a job. So uh, where I live, there's a lot of engineers because there's a lot of colleges as well which people go to. So my city especially has, uh, like you mentioned engineers in your example, and those engineers at this point aren't even getting paid minimum wage because there will be another engineer who will take less than that. So okay. a daily wage laborer where I live makes about uh, uh, at minimum wage, he makes about 300 rupees a day, w and an engineer makes about between 150 to 200. Oh, is that so? Yeah. And so how does that compare with the career in law? Uh, the law the lawyers where I live, even if they're handling very, very small things like stamping your uh, contracts or just going through your papers, they still make a uh, good amounts of money. The lawyers even in, a, I, I live in a village currently near a major city, and even a lawyer there makes well over 60,000 a month. Okay, so you think that the legal education that you've signed up for is worth your buck? Gives you a bang for your buck? Uh, I don't know whether it's given me a bang for my buck yet because I'm still in my No, I'm sure you're talking to some of your seniors, right? Uh, yes. So uh, I am in probably one of the most expensive law schools in the country. Okay. So uh, I was very hesitant about taking that choice because it is a big investment on my part and my parents. So I talked to somebody who passed out of the university and she said that the money you put in is worth it because you get an you get opportunities here like you don't get in other places. You get the kind of exposure and you get the kind of learning that you tend not to have otherwise. Okay, all right, Raj, come in here. That you know, with like the gentleman very candidly said that look, he had to think about the costs uh, given the brand that he's signing up for. But that's not necessarily true with for a number of other colleges that you know exist in India. For those students. Uh, who needs to put their foot down and say, look, you can't demand the kind of fees that you're charging because uh, it's not paying off when these guys are going in the market. And I hear these things regularly when I talk to you know, freshers in litigation who say that at some places they are having to pay uh, you know, senior counsels to intern with them. Well, first of all, I think we need to make an important distinction between uh, the investment that you make for education uh, and you know, sort of dealing it from the jobs that you get immediately after that. But in it's fact, a means to an well, end. I, I mean, education I'll, is important. We I can know, talk academics. But this but is a very sort of a, a business school type model where, you know, placements and the return on investment in education is measured in purely monetary terms after the immediate job. But frankly speaking, it's a 55 to 60 year investment you're making. You are not really investing for the next job that you're making. The fundamentals of university education is what is going to determine your future life and career. So once you start the ROI, not in the framework of the immediate job you're going to get, but the 50 year horizon of the kind of jobs and careers and a, a sort of a trajectory, you will immediately have a different answer. First. Okay. Secondly, as far as cost is concerned, let's become a little more analytical and scientific about it. Cost of education is about is also about what does it take for an institution to be run. And unfortunately in India, the public private divide in India has unfortunately not made us realize how do you determine a cost of a degree program. 
frankly speaking, the most important part of determining the cost of the degree program is what does it take to build a university? What does it take to run a university? What does it take to run a world-class institution from infrastructure cost to faculty cost to all of that? And then you start talking about, okay, if this is what the cost of building and running a good institution, what ought to be the fee structure so that the people who are going to be educated will have to pay for it or alternatively state or other sources subsidize it and then you come to the stage where if this is what the cost is going to be how do you ensure that we have a diversified class because there will be people who simply may not be able to afford that education I mean, frankly, we don't have the conversation. I'm not even going to do the costing for building an institution. Shamna, let me bring you here. The three-member committee who recently submitted its report on the entrance level exam costs, which is the CLAT, uh, that uh, committee concluded that there is 90% profiteering, and we're talking about a national law school. We're not talking about, let's say, a private university, uh, you know, uh, getting this job to conduct the law school admission test. Um, Who's to be held accountable for it? And who's going to tell uh, these national universities that you can't profit your, uh, at an entrance level exam? No, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a great question by Aswini. And, 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 and you know, I fully endorse what Raj said, which is that we have just not been scientific about costs. But there's no systematic analysis of what do these costs go towards. Uh, and I suspect that came to the fore with CLAT, which is the just an application form for writing the law entrance. And the committee very clearly said that this is a 90% profit margin. In fact, if you charge that 1,500 for the CLAT application as opposed to 4,000, you will still make a decent profit. The law schools now argue that, well, we don't have money from any other source. And uh, again, going back to what Raj said, well, the government, these are national law schools. You are supposed to work with the government. These are supposedly public universities. Right. Uh, the government has to foot some of that bill. Other, we can talk to people in the industry, the ones that are hiring. Uh, and, I, uh, and, and I guess we can have that conversation when, when Sandeep comes in, which is that how do all other players in the ecosystem contribute to this? And how do we deliver real value? Because I'm completely with them on the fact that if there is real value, charge. But make sure that somebody pays for it so that the law school, the faculty has to be paid. Uh, and I think Raj has delivered a very successful model of very high quality faculty, but paying them twice or thrice as much as what the national law schools pay. The national law schools pay now because the, uh, the, the pay commission mandates them to pay. Otherwise, they wouldn't have paid the sum. Yeah. The model was always hiring on contract. Let me move to now the second C I want to talk about, which is curriculum. And it's a very example that you know uh, is, is a little personal to me. When I finished law school a couple of years ago, uh, you know I was writing this exam, which was the Presidency Towns Insolvency Act, uh, and I was like, why am I studying this colonial era, uh, you know, act when there is Sarfizi, when there is Sika, when there is DRT, where there is CDR going on. And at that time, even the Companies Act was being looked at by the government, uh, etc. But we were still looking at the old act. Sandeep, I know that you know the basics are important, where it all started is important, but do you feel that there is a disconnect between what students are being taught in law universities versus when they come to you as freshers and you're like, oh, I thought that you, know, you would be taught this in law school? I think what I find is that generally there's very good grounding on concepts, <laughs> on philosophy behind law, some of the rationales and things like that. I think where more work can be done is in A, some practical skills and B, what I would call soft skills. So in practical skills, I would say that you know, if in a semester you are spending 75 80% of the time talking about, let's say in a wills and estates class, you're talking about the philosophy of whether there should be inheritance, whether it should be a state tax, et cetera, please spend at least 10% of time teaching students how to write a will, okay? So that if they're going to practice that law, they have some practical skill. And just, you can use the same analogy for other areas, whether corporate law, tax, and so on. On the soft skills, what we often find uh, lacking is things like communication skills. So for example, you know, if we bring in a first year associate on a call with a client, we find that a lot of work needs to be done in terms of teaching them how to respond, where to pause, where to ask a question, where not to interrupt the client, and, and things like that. Um, and writing, of course, that's, that's a practical skill that needs to be taken care of. I think uh, law schools do do a lot of writing classes. I'm just not sure whether they are, to your earlier point about contemporariness, right. whether they are attuned to 
uh, contemporary writing. So I think if in a law school you're still teaching only how to write a petition, and you're not teaching how to write a memo on, say, the impact of um, Supreme Court's Aadhaar judgment on banks and telecom companies, I'm not sure you are equipping students for today's work. OK. Uh, please come in here, David. But how do you make your curriculum more contemporary? You can't be working in two silos that, you know, laws are changing in the world out there, but you continue to stick to, you know, your old, uh, old acts which, you know, have, have been repealed, have been changed, have been amended to the extent that in the shape and form that they are being taught, uh, they're no more relevant out there in the commercial world. So how do you bridge this gap and how have some of the jurisdictions that you've studied been able to bridge that gap? So I think the very first and most important thing to say is that in law schools, need to study the profession and need to study what's happening in the profession. The law schools can't teach students how to be lawyers in a profession if they don't study that profession. And this is something that's just beginning here in India. I think Raja's school is trying to be a pioneer in this. There are other programs as well. What Shamnath has done over the years has been remarkable. <coughs> But that needs to be a primary focus. That's the first thing. The second thing I think we have to remember is law school is, and this goes, I think, to what Raj was saying, law school is not just a trade school, meaning it's not just teaching people how to do a particular job. And the reason it can't be just that is because the job of a lawyer is changing constantly. And it's going to change even more rapidly in the lives of these students through things that Shamnad studies, like artificial intelligence or machine learning or globalization uh, or the uh, blurring of the boundary between law and business and policy and, and uh, human resources, psychology. That means what law schools have to do primarily is to teach a set of critical thinking skills that allows students to be able to continue to be lifelong learners as they move throughout their legal careers. So if you put those two things together, if you teach students how is the profession of law changing, how are uh, things that lawyers are being asked to do being now influenced by technology, by globalization, by the intersection of law and business and humanities and, and economics with a set of critical thinking skills about how to uh, understand change and how to navigate change. And then those soft skills that, uh, that, uh, 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 that Sandeep said about how to present yourself, how to work in a team, how to be a leader, how to give advice, all these things that lawyers have to do, those are the things that law schools can do a much better job of. And that's very different than teaching them the latest iteration of the corporate law or the tax law, because those things are going to change. It's the ability to work in a changing environment that we need to teach students. Okay, Kelly, give me your perspective here. At what point does a university decide that what's happening out there in terms of a new law or a new amendment needs to come into the curriculum? And is it not a fair ask to then uh, you know, continually assess what you're teaching to your students, whether it's your first year or you know, your fifth year, uh, that uh, you know things need to change now. At what point do universities take this call? It's a great question, and uh, I think uh, absolutely all those things can be done. It's really not an either or. Um, you can, in a legal education, it, you know, through the course of it, both help students understand the you know the theory and the doctrine and the current events and the skills and the values and all, all of that within a curriculum. And so I think it's really important for us to see that we don't need to pick just one of those, that when we give that value to students that we should, it's really about putting that all together so that it's really a, you know, the best that we can do in the time that we have with the students. I think uh, if I'm very specific, I uh, study at General Global Law School and uh, I spent three weeks at a national law university and uh, obviously, um, as part of you know, uh, 
pursuing law as a career, it's very important to know how to present yourself in court, uh, to know the basics of mooting and trial advocacy. But uh, in, our, uh, in our university, it's a course which has been introduced in third year. And um, in other law schools, the freshers seem to be already into it. They seem to be uh, getting an edge, seemingly getting an edge over all of us. Uh, so I believe that you know studying fundamental subjects like sociology, legal methods, jurisprudence is really important. But uh, at the same time, I feel like we, I know private and uh, government are completely separate. But at the end of the day, when we look into the job market for opportunities, we can't ignore the fact that hey, there's going to be a competition out there. So I feel that you know, um, if you look at litigation specifically, introducing trial advo uh, mooting and trial advocacy should have been introduced from earlier and I feel like we're at a disadvantage in terms of that. We have a very strong philosophical underpinnings about legal education in which the foundations of legal education ought to be based upon humanities and social sciences. Philosophy, political science, history, anthropology, sociology and these subjects should be taught as a, and economics ought to be the foundation of learning those for the high school leavers in the first couple of years when they ultimately transition to legal education. I am very conscious that the functional and instrumental dimension of education need to be balanced with the more substantive foundational learning, particularly when we are talking about undergraduate education. Okay, all right. There are some more comments and questions here, please. Law is an evolving concept and anything which is evolving is incomplete in itself. So how do judges actually come to conclusions and opinions to decide a case which comes under the purview of law? How does this mechanism work and how does this dynamism of law create an impact on the economy in this era of globalization? It's a great question because that question of how do you teach judgment, how do you develop that as a professional skill, I think is really the, something that is the fascination of legal education because if you talk with judges, if you've been in complex practices, what you find is every day you're surprised by the newness of the question that you're trying to answer. And so you're drawing upon your humanities, you're drawing upon your legal knowledge, you're drawing upon your soft skills of empathy for people and a, and a solidarity with humanity and understanding of how society might, might move and develop. And all that together is trying to give you a sense of the situation and, and a judgment for what's right now and will that stand the test of time as, as law moves forward. All right, there's a question again. Okay, first, I'd like to pick on from where uh, the first question that you asked about uh, us finding the atmosphere in the classroom where we feel that some more things need to be added or subtracted. Uh, after my LLB, I didn't come to law. I went and worked in banks. So I didn't know about these things that have developed in the recent years. So I come to the classroom and I find that a professor who's done his PhD in, say, biotech law is teaching international banking law to me. Although the professor is great, I must say, no, no, comes, no complaints about his teaching whatsoever. And there are many parts of the law school that I find this. Now that set me thinking, and I finally come to the conclusion that we cannot afford that kind of specialization yet over here. It'll be too expensive for us. For example, there may be um, banking and financial law in Queen Mary, um, London University. Now, that professor has been teaching banking and financial law for years, right? We cannot have that as of now. Uh, that's my understanding. So I think that's a great uh, question, or, or this a great point that you made. And, uh, and I think that's an excellent example of where private practitioners can come in and fill the gap that you yes. talked about, right? Um, so I, I picked up on banking and finance because uh, you know, I spent several years working in-house in that industry. Uh, and also in my law practice experience, I've done a lot of that. So, uh, so if that's one of the places where the university is looking to fill in that gap, I'm ready to volunteer. <laughs> this is the challenge that we have in India, that the interaction between the practitioners and academia is unfortunately very limited. Uh, and it is, there are structural problems in public institutions for involvement. And I must say that by and large, be it the lawyers, the judges, both the corporate and litigating bar, 
they see largely universities and law schools as an occasional sort of visit and give one lecture or a seminar or that at, at its best or at worst they see them as recruitment platforms they don't see them as knowledge partners in an effort to build institutional capacity you can't lament about the fact that why you don't have that type of experiences in our law schools because there has been indifference on the part of industry law firms and corporations including the in-house councils to engage with law schools in a more substantive manner even if i keep the benchmark low can law schools here at least deliver basic legal education which is you know there's a constant fad about the latest thing i had a professor in law school corporate law he never taught us sebi this was you know 19 the the, the 1990s india's liberalizing sebi is there foreign investment coming in he went back to the early 1900 case law Uh, and Sandeep will bear me out on this. I asked my classmates today. I said, you know, we cribbed then. We said, why is he not teaching us the latest stuff? He went on Lee versus Lee, Solomon versus Solomon, the jurisprudential basis behind company law. And if I ask my classmates who are now leading partners at law firms, they say those building blocks were so important because we became super creative. Once you have the building blocks straight, I can build on top of that. It's like what Elon Musk says. You know, I build the tree trunk, and the leaves I can easily attach. at the end and i think that's our real goal to be, to build a basic so strong that the rest they can pluck and they can they can do it on their own why do we need to teach them everything sure okay on that point let me move to the third c that we want to talk about and which is careers i will come to you and i will get uh, sandeep here to uh, weigh in on when you interact with freshers sandeep uh, what is that what are those couple of skills that you go like uh, oh i wish law school started or uh, you know to prepare or better prepare these freshers for a career uh, as opposed to let's say some of the softer skills uh, but i will keep going back to the practical knowledge the practical skills that on day 1 when you're an a0 uh, or let's say interning or you're working with a senior counsel you're expected to know when i look to hire somebody i'm not necessarily looking for the right experience in that area so let's say i'm looking for a fifth year associate in the uh, policy and regulatory practice to me it's not so important that in the last four years they have done policy and regulatory to me it's what what important is for whatever work they have done they have demonstrated the ability to think analyze research and write okay So, in terms of practical skills, I would say that translates into the ability to do research, to spot issues, uh, to write, uh, and I think of all these three, I think writing is where I see the biggest gap. Uh, you know, uh, you know, there's things like so when a first year associate is told that okay, I would like to see a first draft of a memo next Friday, right? They literally take it as the first draft. what they should be thinking is that it should be the best draft of their life <laughs> right that should come to me as their first draft right and that makes all the difference you have to keep on working on it until it looks like a piece of art and not just cobbling together and copying pasting and researching and just putting it in there one of the things that uh, i think we sh- all students should should remember is that writing skills there are skills of writing of course but in so many ways sometimes failures to write well are failures to think well and so just remember that those skills of critical thinking that's what helps you be a good writer too once you have the very you know fundamental building blocks of writing and so continuing to develop those critical skills are what will help you serve your clients and serve your world okay we have a question mr washit said that uh, uh, law law school is supposed to give uh, any university is supposed to give you a sense of purpose and supposed to help you find what way you want to take you taught at nujs and you studied at uh, nls and i'm sure you've seen a lot of people who went to study law and probably went in with a lot of resolve who decided to change their course later and they've gone into a variety of different fields and that is important you need to give the people the freedom to think however as you said uh, the people in the industry are saying it takes a whole year for them to catch up which i'm sure for them as well is immensely frustrating because in that time you have to keep somebody and you have to pay them and they aren't giving you the value that they might feel that they deserve out of the employees as well because lawyers aren't cheap right so how do you make those worlds meet how do you make sure that they achieve a certain level of excellence in the industry while yet being able to have a certain level of creativity and freedom to go through other interests shamad you want to take that 
one of the things that we thought of was if in the absence of a full-fledged clinic, can we bring in the practitioners to take courses, but in a rigorous way, not a one-off lecture. You know, when I was in law school, we had these old judges uh, and these senior lawyers come in, you know, just extremely boring lectures, nobody paid attention, right? Well, not all of them, some of them. Uh, but then, when we started engaging with practitioners, there are a lot of practitioners who are, you know, scholarly in their orientation, who are actually deep, you know, very, very deep thinkers, uh, can come in and want to engage with academia because it, uh, you know, it, it sort of gives them, uh, it, it ignites a certain passion in them when they come into the law schools, and law schools really need to tap into that. But get them to come in and teach even a short course. Uh, but within the framework of the law school, you will get that practical infusion. We were chatting a little uh, while ago that, uh, and this ties all the three C's that we have talked about today. Uh, the students that come to your university have the option of both a three-year course and a five-year course. And this gentleman also sort of touched upon that point briefly that not all those who are doing these five-year course when they're 17 taking or are able to take a definitive call that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, is it time for our universities then, the National Law School universities, to also offer uh, a three-year course where you can take a better educated, informed call that law is my calling in life and not have to make that decision when you're way early, just after class 12 in school? I think it's a great question, Bhaiswini. I think, uh, you know, the five-year uh, law program and our focus on it uh, was extremely important from a historical milestone perspective because you see the five years what got law on the mainstream table uh, because till then law was uh, the study of law was possibly the last option for almost anyone that wanted to do a professional degree it was important then to sort of resuscitate law to bring it back on the table to give it a certain reputation uh, and for that the model that professor menon and the others who were the founding fathers of the national law school model uh, what they thought then was uh, that we should really make it into a five-year program so that students coming straight out of uh, uh, straight out of school would have something to aspire towards in terms of professional degree and you could also uh, better mold their minds uh, rather than having students who are coming from first degrees who are a little more political in their orientation in, as part of university networks and setups where students are much more political we have a ready bunch of students uh, that can be disciplined much more easily that will sit in classes full time uh, and I think that particular narrative has served its purpose now one of our best models is really to go back uh, through the three-year model and to invite a diversity of people, especially now that law is popular and may attract the bankers, may attract the scientists, may attract others. And I, I'm a specialist in intellectual property and I see it day in and day out that we are the much poorer for it because we're getting straight-jacketed people straight out of five-year programs into IP and not the scientists, not the economists, not the historians who can lead, who can lend a much richer perspective uh, to the study of these subjects and make legal education and make even uh, and, and even serve better as legal professionals. We have a question there. My question is a very basic one. So I just wanted to like tell you, I'm a BALLB student. I'm in my first year, in fact, the first semester. So we don't really have the depth of knowledge about law. We don't actually even know the definition of law. We're just here from high school. So what do you expect from us? Like what should actually we expect from the upcoming years? Should we like start about thinking law as a profession from the very beginning, or we should just consider whatever they are teaching in college, like we should focus on that. I don't think this is something that you have to decide today. I think it can vary with different people. Let it come to you naturally. There may be some of you who may know on day one that I want to be a practicing lawyer, I want to be a litigator, I want to be this or that. There may be some of you who may not know till the fifth year exactly what they want to do, and I think that's totally fine. Each individual is different, and you have all these choices, so wh why do you have to force yourself to make a call on day one? So, so you, have, you have time on your side. David, uh, I am going to give the last word to you on if you have to give one advice to law schools in India yeah. and one advice to law students, what would those two things be, uh, what would those two things be uh, considering that you've looked at several jurisdictions? Law schools in India, particularly the, the leading ones that we've talked a lot about here, uh, I think do a very good job of teaching students um, s basic legal principles and to how to think about certain areas of the law. What they don't do as well is to teach them about what careers in law look like and can look like. And to empower students, not just to learn a particular area or a particular subject, but to learn how to 
not just think like a lawyer, but to think about the role of law and society more broadly and how they want to be a part of it. And that's the, uh, the message for law students, which is to think of this as an opportunity to learn about yourself and to learn about the world and to be excited about the possibilities that are out there. I was saying in the break that th there's so many areas of law that didn't exist when I was your age. I mean, think of human rights law or environmental law or the law of cybersecurity or the law of privacy or gender studies or uh, all sorts of kinds of ways that you can be using your legal skills that didn't exist before that don't often mean just practicing law. So the fact that many people go to law school and then end up doing other things is, I think, a very good thing because it shows the way in which law is more and more important in every part of our society and every part of our society is more and more important in understanding law. Well, debates like this may seem academic, but they're important to make Indian legal education globally competitive. Thank you all for bringing in your questions, and I hope that all the insights that uh, you know, our panelists here uh, brought into the conversation will benefit you in your careers and you as you take away some of those messages with you after watching this show. Thank you for joining us here on The Fine Print, and thank you so much for watching. Thank you.